Oh, okay, okay. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm Joseph Hausiel, the Director of Core of Culture, and I'm here today with Scott Park Phillips, my friend, who is an author of two books, a martial arts practitioner, a dancer, and a historian. And we agreed two weeks ago that Scott would allow me to interview him with three questions. And we got through one question. And the one question was about the golden elixir. So for those of you who have read Scott's books and would like to hear this ex exposition of the golden elixir, thank you. <laughs> and um, I think you'll find last week's interview, um, which you can find on Scott's YouTube channel, um, really helpful and beneficial. So today, Scott has agreed to uh, allow me to pick up with question two, and we'll take it from there. Scott, thank you very much for talking with me today. My pleasure. So question number two, Scott, um, I'll set it up a little bit. <clears throat> uh, this is a question about history and practice. <clears throat> so it's a question about historians and practitioners. So we might be talking a bit about the nature of history and the nature of practice. And the reason why it's got me fascinated is because in recent weeks, working with a prominent art historian from the School of Oriental and African Studies, and then a bit later hearing from a professional historian at the University of Chicago Oriental Institute, I heard this expression, historians are looking for breaks. Now, the art historian added, historians are looking for breaks and practitioners are looking for continuity. And he said this in such a way, and so the two shall never meet. Um, I thought, well, this is interesting. I know a historian of practice. That's you. And I thought, well, you're wearing these two hats. You're a historian of practice and you're a practitioner. So I want to ask you a bit, first of all, what do you make of this statement? Historians are looking for breaks and practitioners are looking for continuity. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's some truth to that statement. Um, I, I think, well, I personally think that the breaks are, are extremely important. I don't think that my work would be possible without studying the breaks. And so there are some very key breaks, for instance, the, the 20th century, you know, studying, studying China, the 20th century, beginning, really the Boxer Uprising is the, is the fundamental, it's the beginning of a war against religion and theater and martial arts. And there's a kind of, uh, you, you can't really, if you, if you don't understand that break, you can't understand the continuity. That's the problem right there. If you don't understand what the break was, you, you can't understand what the continuity was. Um, but I, as a practitioner, I, I just start a little bit by saying how, how I kind of got here, which is that I, you know, I was in San Francisco um, in, in, I became a dancer actually as an exchange student in Australia. And I'd already been studying martial arts since I was 10. So I had that, I had some background there, but I, I became a dancer and I came back to San Francisco and my body wasn't doing, it wasn't cooperating. It wasn't doing everything I wanted it to do. And at this, and so I wanted male teachers and, and the AIDS crisis was in full bloom and people were dying in the dance world everywhere. And this is, this is 88. Right, um, and or even a couple years earlier, and and it was, and so, but San Francisco had this other thing, which was ethnic dance, which was a, a the the culmination of the concept of of multicultural studies, um, or multiculturalism, and there were two hundred semi professional ethnic dance groups happening in San Francisco and there were funds for it. And there was a milieu where everyone was sharing, um, but everyone was very distinct. And these were masters from all over the world. And I, 
I just dove into that world to find, partly to find male teachers. Um, and so I had the opportunity to experience uh, dance as a world phenomenon. And okay, really- I just interject for a minute. Were you not, if you were dealing with a lot of ethnic dancers with teachers that had come to this country, were you not dealing with a lot of people who were embodying a break? Yeah, absolutely. And so that the that question of break is really important. But they were also uh, desperate in some in not not in a not in a, a, a painful way, but desperate in a kind of uh, the the importance. There was an importance in all of these people in 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 preserving authenticity. Authenticity was the watchword you know, for what everyone was doing. And it didn't mean, and, and, and nobody in that community thought of traditionalism as a lack of creativity, right? So there was no sense in which we're freezing this. So, and, and that's a problem you, you find, you know, when historians have this sort of view, I think, of these arts as frozen in some sense, even, and, and, and they see it as a tragic thing because it because movement isn't frozen, so you can't possibly know what it was before. That's that's how they frame the problem. You're right. You're right. They do. They make a false enemy in a way. Right. And I'm in it, going well. Okay, I can study Haitian dance, right? And yes, there are several breaks. Clearly, it came to me through Catherine Dunham, but Catherine Dunham brought Jean Leon Destinée, you know. To the United States, and 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 so I could study with John. I did. I got a, a whole week with John Leon Destiné, you know, who grew up in this Haitian world. And there's plenty of Haitians around, also, right? So I have this sort of dance tradition in America built on Haitian dance, and so I I can compare. I can see like what what are they changing? What when when you when you start thinking in terms of the, this is a constant conversation, right, among dancers. When you start thinking in terms of the proscenium arch, right? the stage, what changes, right? What's going to change? You face and, front. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just about to get to that. But, um, but, the, the, uh, but stuff changes, right? And so you can see that that kind of thing would cause not really a break, but a change in the continuity. Um, but for instance, I studied, uh, well, so I finished with the African thing. So, so, you know, and then I study, and I'm studying with Malanga Kaskular doing Congolese dance, right? And I'm like, okay, these traditions are related. I don't know if it's a thousand year break or a 500 year break or a kind of thing where there was communication continuously in small amounts. I don't know that. That's an unknown, but I can tell in my body, these things are related. I can also tell that there are things that are quite different. Right, that if you that are certain kinds of movement that, it, if you're doing Congolese dance, you do that thing. If you're doing Haitian dance, you do that thing. And maybe I could name it. You know, we could put some names on it. And, but the thing is, is it it's not known thing. What I'm saying is it's known. It's not ambiguous, even if it's hard to name. And in uh, in Katak dance. For instance, you know, I had uh, I, I recently um, last couple of years went to got involved with some Catholic dancers locally. And my training was when I was 20, 25. Right. So it's it's, 50, it's 25 years ago, more than 25 years ago. So I was there and and I, you know, if you can walk, I have the training. I can walk into any class, any kind of class in the world and start dancing. It's I don't need to be. My training is deep enough. It's an impression. Right you might say in the body, it's deep enough, I can walk in and do it. But you know, what the teacher says to me is, you know, you, you're the spitting image of your teacher. I knew your teacher in the 1970s. You know, it's like, okay, so there's, it's Kathak, undeniably it's Kathak dance, but also I'm Chitresh, I'm Chitresh Das, you know, like I'm, but of course I'm me, but <laughs> so for instance, just to give you an example, the way we, but the fact that she was able to see your teacher in your dancing instantly, right? Because she can see it, right? And so you do a fast spin, right? And the way Chitras did it is you freeze like a statue and then you start to breathe, right? And so that's right. But in their tradition, it's like the way you 
you hit the beat, you hit the foot hits at the exact same time, the same way. But then your body is more like smoke. So you don't have that freeze. Right. And I can see it. Right. So I'm like, oh, I could try that, you know, but that's not what's in my body yet. So this is this kind of thing. So. So. For instance, here's another example. I, I went to I was in London and uh, I ended up at this sort of private showing of Chinese opera, um, you know, as things happen in our world. And there was it was a it was educational thing. So it was questions. And I asked about the I just asked, you know, playing a little bit dumb. I asked about the relationship between the mime in this Chinese opera and in Indian dance, because I'm looking at it. And I've studied enough my Western mime too to know um, that the the Indian and Chinese mime is about sixty percent the same, right? So that tells me almost because there's no there's nothing the same in in Western mime. And I also know something else I know about mime, which is that um, the Keith Johnstone, the great improvisation teacher. Um, was like, no, no, we don't need to teach mime. You just need to get people to see the objects they're working with. If you can see the can of tuna fish and the can opener, if you can see them, then when you put them together, you know, you're going to get the action right. You're go it's going to look like the thing, right? You don't actually need to train mime. That was his view. But for, uh, for audiences at a distance, you start to need to train mime because you, you have to exaggerate the movement so people can see it. And that's where you get these. And this is just, it's, it's, it's something you know. As a practitioner, you just get, you, there are things you know. And I don't know how you would prove that exactly, but it's not, it's not um, there isn't much to debate about it. You know what I mean? It's like just true. What I think is debatable among more traditional scholars is what they would call evidence of proof. And you know, you said something earlier, it was very interesting. You've said a number of quite interesting things, but one was my body told me that these are really similar things. Yeah. So you're talking about your own body, but a, a trained and practiced body um, uh, informing you of some aspect of a movement that may or may not be connected. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about the body as the touchstone of that kind of question. And even the kind of question of this is an old movement, this is not an old movement, this is an authentic movement, this is a modified movement. Um, and I wonder what you make of those sorts of distinctions. Right, as a practitioner. Well, I, let me actually answer that question in a more general way, and sure. and, and then you can sort of pit, try to pin me down. Um, the, you know, I, I you know, because you know about Japanese dance, so I think it's called mang, uh, mangaku. Um, it's an ancient ancient Japanese dance that was, and the oldest references to it describe, um, you know, the a a platoon of the army standing for 24 hours on one knee, you know, or at, at attention on one knee with the theater facing the back with the performers facing the back. So they're actually watching the back of the performance. And, and I don't know how you stay in, in. And so, and so I, I thought that like, what's that? Right. Right. I remember being in my early twenties and hearing about that and go reading about it and going, what is that? Right. But it's an art. Yeah. And, and so, but then I thought, well, okay, you know, in, in my parents' generation, the Catholic Church did the, you know, the, um, the mass facing the altar, not fit, you know, and, and I've been on the stage performing with my back to the audience, done that, that's a thing, you know, that's an experience that you can have, you can replicate it. Um, and, and, um, and I also know what it's like to try and stand still for six hours, because I've done that. I don't standing still for twenty four hours. Whoa! Uh, but you, you know, you 
you get in your own, you're from your own experience, you can, you can get some insight into it. And the, the reason this is important is because if we're asking questions about the way something, something was created in the past, part of what you want to know is people's motivations for creating it. And one way to do that is through your own experience. And this actually has a name. Historians have named this. That, um, uh, well, I've, my wife called it somatic history. So like the history that you experience in your body um, or through your senses. But I um, oh, understood that before. So for somatic historian means the history of your own body's history of learning movement. Would you say that? Is that what no, a somatic? No, no. no. I, what would rough, somatic history be? What, what it means is roughly equivalent to the, to the term. I, I'm not sure if she coined it. I think her, her teacher coined it. Uh, what do I think it's um, Rachel uh, Fulton Brown, who's at the University of Chicago, is a, a, a medievalist. And she has a book, which is a collection of essays um, uh, on medieval history and alchemy, in fact, many other things like that. Um, and it's called uh, History in the Comic Mode. And she explains that, you know, that this concept of history in the comic mode is in contrast to the tragic mode. The tragic mode is where you, you don't have direct evidence of something. Um, so you, you would just say, we don't know. That's the tragic view. That, and the comic view is you say, well, what can I know about this? You know, what, what can I do? What, what can I experience that will give me more to experience about this? And the example she gives is that she, she was studying the, the, the nuns liturgy in the middle ages where they, what they were doing was they were visualizing um, uh, sucking the pus from Jesus's wounds and simultaneously visualizing that experience as, um, as a, the, the most delicious ambrosia. Sounds right? like Tantra, yeah. It sounds like Tantra, right? And so they're, they're doing this. And she said, well, if you're a historian, you should do that. You should try that practice because you've got the text here and you've got the description of the visualization. It doesn't mean you can replicate what they're experiencing, but you can certainly, you can certainly do that by doing that. You can certainly rule out certain possibilities about what the experience was like and what it, what it was and wasn't like, and you might actually get close to it. And it would certainly be likely to inspire you. And the reason for the terms comic and tragic um, and this, is really I could keep going with this quite a bit, but is that the the idea of 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 a, a tragedy in a tragedy the lead character doesn't change. Everything it has, it has a fatal flaw. Well, uh, well, the fatal flaw is that they don't change. Actually, I think this is my own it's view. But correct, that's the thing that won't change. But that, that's that that's what tragedy defines a tragedy. Yes, yes, yeah. you can you can construct it around a flaw. Yeah, but but it's. It's if you're thinking about it in terms of mask work, for instance, it's that their face doesn't change. No matter how much chaos, craziness is going around them, they won't change. And a co in comedy, the opposite is true. The small little things cause huge changes. In the <laughs> so you're 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 over. You're always in. You're doing comedy. You're always over changing. Um, and this is somewhat parallel to the, the Chinese split. In the Chinese theatrical split, you have one, which means culture, and wu, which means warrior. And all comics are warriors, actually, in the Chinese tradition. Um, so they have these sort of two types of theater. I and mean, of course, they overlap in all sorts of plays. They often overlap. But the, the fruition of the audience watching a wu play is passion an experience of passion they in its word it's a little tricky doesn't mean passion exactly but you have a you you have an intense emotional response and uh, and connection and in the woo tradition in the martial plays you 
what do you think? You get exuberance, right? You get, you get giddy, you get excited, you get physically involved in, and that's the fruition of a, of a woo play. Um, and now, just to help us out here a little bit, are you, are we talking about the early 20th century now? Are you talking about, we started, you're saying, well, the Boxer Rebellion was one such thing that could be looked at as a profound change, if not a break. And the break helps you understand the continuity. So when you're talking about these two forms of Chinese theater, can you help me place that in time a little bit? Yeah, uh, I, I'm talking about continuity here. I'm talking about continuity going back to the beginning of what the Chinese call theater, which is the Yuan Dynasty. Of course, they always had theater, but the Yuan Dynasty, so um, 12th century. Um, so you would say there's a continuity really that's comprehensible from the Yuan Dynasty until the Boxer Rebellion. Yeah, and and that's actually in in religion too. The same they have the same split. It's very just just like we have tragic and comic. It's not. There's continuity. There's an you you could say that the meaning of comic change or the meaning of tragic change, but not much. Like it's it's as a historian, you the the important question as a historian there is: Are you asking a good question? Because I because this really what this really comes down to if we're talking about about breaks versus continuity what it what it really comes down to is what do i want history to do for, for i me? agree i agree with you right. i think that's, i think that's the more relevant question uh, to my mind it's too grand a statement to say historians are looking for breaks and practitioners are looking for continuity i think it's a way to dismiss practitioners um mm -hmm. the other thing i wondered too really is that what if I want to write a history of continuity? Uh, what if that's the history I want to write? And I just think for a minute, you know, Dante, they say, well, you know, heaven, everything's perfect and it's just so boring. No one wants to read it. They want to read the Purgatorio and they want to read the Inferno. Heaven, eh, everything works too well. Um, so I wondered if there's a little, a little bit of that too, that, you know, well, continuity, everything's humming along. I need something more dramatic for my history. Um, but I, I, I feel I, about this question, you know, too, what, what is the body's own living affirmation of that knowledge in either case? So I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I sent you in an email this, this sort of bizarre idea that, that good history is an exorcism and and i think people like you know i my my the editor editor people who helped me edit the first book i used the word exorcism a lot and they're like are you sure you want to use that word you know because in the west that's just going to have people's head spinning around and vomiting and like or, like i don't like you know i do want to use this word but it, it is it, I because understand. the word is absolutely relevant to asian culture and to ancient culture and we shouldn't be limited by our modern. Yeah, exactly. And I, we need to tell a different story about it. And and so one way you can understand what Taoist exorcism is, it's about putting things in order. It's about going to an experience of chaos via the golden elixir and then establishing a kind of order. And that's the, the, that's the basic concept of the ritual itself. And that what you're doing if you're if you what you're dealing with is and i'll just use this because i could make this sound more modern but we're talking about other entities like gods and demons and ghosts what you're doing is you're sending them home <laughs> you're giving them a place you're, you're you're resolving their anxieties that's what the exorcism does and in a sense i had this incredibly strong sense again it's a, my, mo, my own motivation, using my own motivations to try and understand other people's motivations in the past, right? This is like, how do I connect with Mark Twain, right? Um, you know, like I try to understand what he, what he was talking about, you know, um, through my own experience. And so I had this experience studying Chinese martial arts that because the story wasn't matching the practice, you know, that there was all this mime there and there was no explanation for why there was mime in the 
in the art, right? As one example, I can give you hundreds of examples. I, but before we get there, when you say the story, I, this is very interesting. You're saying I'm studying martial arts and I'm reading about the martial arts and I'm reading about Chinese history. And I'm like, wait a minute, here I am in my practice life, serious life life of practice and what I'm learning, the history, the stories, they're not, they're not jiving with me. They're not aligning with me. I'm seeing something's wrong either with the history or the practice. And I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit to your idea that good history is an exorcism by, I guess, giving a troubled thing a place to reside. Um, but I, if you could say more a little bit about that, I think that would be great. Yeah. So, 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 you know, the, the, there was this, this in incongruence right between what i was practicing which i loved practicing but i but there was no explanation of why there was mime there right and and in fact there was a story that didn't match about it being a pure martial art um this concept of a pure martial art and so i i i experienced that as a kind of ghost right that there was a you could say a ghost is uh, here's here's a here's a kind of the classic ghost, right? Somebody dies with a desire. Someone in your family dies with a, a deep desire, right? And you're left with the sense that it sh you should help fulfill that desire. It's a weird thing. You might not be, but especially if it's a parent or an ancestor, they want something for you or they want something for the world or something incomplete. You know, I have my stack of books and I look at them and I think. You know, my grandparents, they they were happy every time I read a book, you know, it's like and I'm sure now that they're dead, they don't really care about reading, but there's a lingering sense. Right. And I know that now it, it would be possible for me to pass that on. If it, that's a positive one, but it could be a negative one, like a negative, especially this happens with negative associations that you could pass on a negative association from an ancestor and not give any of the context. And that's how you get a ghost because a person feels the impulse to do something, but doesn't know where it's coming from or why. So it's really hard to resolve. And that's what I thought was, that's what I experienced doing Chinese martial arts. I was like, there's so many elements here that have no resolution. Why am I doing it this way? You know, even the teacher would say, you know, your hands can't be here. They have to be here. Well, why? I'm fighting a big guy in my head. You know, what's the, why are you doing that? You know, like what, if the explanation is it's for fighting, this can't be the reason. There has to be another reason, you know? And, and then people come up with the most ridiculous reasons. You're like, that's just the reason you came up with. Let's actually try and figure out why someone passed this ghost on. This motivation. Well, in terms of looking at a ritual, you know, I'm looking at some rituals, some ancient rituals, but I don't know that the subject is so different, uh, whether it's a deity or a concept of the universe or a concept of emptiness or a, a cosmological concept embodied as a deity that gets you to emptiness. Um, but nevertheless, it, 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 I, I'm hearing you and you're saying passing down something that isn't resolved. And it takes uh, it, it it involves a renewal to reestablish order, and that reestablishment of order is the kind of exorcism I think you're talking about, um, which is that thing that that doesn't end it for all time. Nothing's ended for all time. You know, you'll have to go back and renew the ritual and renew the experience. Um, but this goes to, I guess, also in terms of history, like what's your history about? Is it a history about ritual? Is it a history of theater? Is it a history of a movement practice? Um, so that when you do a movement practice, the history is what? Is the history lore? Is it writing? Is history what you've been able to pick up? Because anybody who's studying Chinese martial arts knows Chinese history is huge. It's an enormous history. It's an ancient history. Uh, you can become a super specialist in a sliver of that history. And so even this Chinese martial arts is embedded in this even larger history of things that carry forward or not, which is relevant to the issue of martial arts. And you thinking in, in, in a way something was lost or something about the explanation was lost along the way, forgotten, 
intentionally obscured? How were you making that understanding between history and your own practice? Well, narratives. You, you actually need coherent narratives. Um, and and I, I understand, and I hope everyone understands that by creating a, a, a coherent narrative, it's possible that you're leaving some information out. It's possible that you that the narrative is not right, and you have to keep that possibility there. But isn't that always true? But it's always true, and that's the key I mean, point here. If, if it's a tight little pat narrative, it's probably not right. You know, it's probably no. Too- I mean, right? Let's say ben Franklin had a moment, right? I read in a bio- biography. Ben Franklin had this moment where he was like, "Should I become a printer?" Or should I teach swimming? You know, should I travel to European capitals and teach swimming, or should I become a printer? And because he made the choice to become a printer, we have, you know, what happens. And you know, who knows if that's really true? But right, right, it, right. It, it's as a narrative, it's potent. It, it and I remembered it, and and it tells you something. It and the reason we study narratives like that is because it actually gives us um, a, a way to reflect on our own choices, right? So. Um, the, the, uh, Peter Matheson, I, you know, I went to hear Peter Matheson talk at you know, like a bookstore or something. He's this, um, his a historian and a fiction writer. Right. Um, and, and it was like a really rainy cold night or something. So I showed him there was barely anybody there. So I got to like talk to him for a while. And he was like, look, uh, you know, people make this distinction between my fiction and my my history and my my nonfiction, and but they're actually I'm always talking about the same stuff. Even when I'm in different cultures, I'm always talking about the same stuff. I mean, the question and see in, in one of his, his first big one was uh, at play in the fields of the Lord. Um, is about a missionary, you know, in the Amazon, you know, by himself, you know, trying to convert the natives, and it's a wonderful book and it's fiction. But of course, that happened. There, were, he was imagining. He was, he was saying, you know, I don't. Ha- I have a bunch of data points, right, about the the history here, but not enough about one person to make it a good narrative. So I'll just make up the narrative, right? And I actually, I actually thought about doing that myself. And like, could I? What, uh, years ago, I mean, about two thousand eight, I was thinking, could I do this with Tai Chi? Could I just do what he did? Um. But I, I think you can. I can. I could. But I, I decided that it. actually there was that the problem wasn't really that we didn't have enough information. It was that people were looking in the wrong place. That's and when I realized that, I was like, no, I could actually write a history um, by just but looking. You know, I gotta, I, that's a very you're onto something very interesting. I think also about a number of things. But one of them is that. Um, Sometimes I think, you know, your idea, like, could you go back and write a historical novel about a theatrical martial artist in 1895? Um, and the reason why I, I you, here I am encouraging you to write here, I've got three books I want you to write. Um, <laughs> but but there's one of my favorite books in the world is called The House of Kanze. And it's about Japanese no theater. Now, I know a lot about Japanese no theater. I studied it for seven years. I've read a lot about it. I've written theses on Japanese. I, nothing is better than that novel. Nothing is better than that novel. You get so involved in the people and the lifetime and the choices they had to make. And, and, and it just fleshes out the entire experience of it. Doesn't deny them or affirm them, but it fleshes them all out. And so it's a very interesting idea that you bring forward about a way to remember things just to remember things and you're also making me think of the fact that in buddhism and in other asian traditions and some in the west history is hagiographical you know history is is got golden glows around it um and so again westerners scholars will sometimes oh it's a hagiography it was written on purpose for a reason. It wasn't like they didn't know what they were writing. <laughs> they knew what they were writing. So this idea of where does the historical novel, where does the hagiography uh, play? What does it play in trying to 
remember. And I had a wonderful performance anthropologist, Joan Erdman, say to me, the question isn't, is there a book? Is there a chart? Is there a diagram? Is there a dance manual? The question is, how did they remember it? That's the question. And then I think for people like us, then the following question, well, how did they transmit it? How did mm -hmm. they remember it? Yes, but how did they transmit it? And was a memory aid involved in the transmission that then might got have lost in future transmissions? So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about that and maybe why that idea of writing a historical novel about a Tai Chi character appealed to you for a while and maybe why now it doesn't appeal to you so much, uh, appeals to me, but I wonder why did your thinking change about that? Well, I. I don't think my thinking has changed. I just think that that um, I think that the the I think the historical novel could could happen, um, but I think that I think that there was there were real that that there, like it's like Peter Matheson's thing. Like, well, if I have enough data, then I'm going to write a history, right? It's that kind of thing, and and so. Um, I, maybe talking about Bagua Zhang is a little bit better. For instance, there there are all sorts of things that all that the that the current generation, the the living generations right now, will say about Bagua Zhang, um, and some of them are um, are probably true, and some of them are probably false, and some of them are probably there in order to cover up a truth. And some of them are probably there in order to um, to preserve a truth in some other format. You right? must say more about those two things. How can something <laughs> be there to cover up a truth? And how can something be there to bring forward a truth? Those are very interesting observations. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, it was just sort of me sitting back and going, OK, I'm getting all this information. And if I if I look at Bagua Zhang, not as just what did my teacher say, but what are all the different teachers around saying? What are all the books written on it so far? What are they saying? What is what do they say in common? Because I'm sorting myths. Right. So you could call it sorting myths or sorting stories. Right. What can I what can I what can I rule out if I can rule it out as true? then I need an explanation for why it was told, right? And if I could, that, right? And so, so I was just playing that piano, right? And looking to like, okay, so, because what I want to get at is what it came from. And I want well, to- Why would someone make up a story that covers up something true about Bagua Jean? Can you give us an example of that to just get a better handle on the idea? The interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the most- it's the most important idea actually here. So I, I, I like, so it's not an easy one to get at. Um, the, and, and, and it also creates a lot of anger um, in people who believe they've been told the truth, right? That kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's a ghost as well. Um, oh, that's the, interesting. The, the, um, so the earliest reference to Bagua Zhang um, is on a tombstone. And it doesn't actually name Bagua Zhang, but it's the, the people who are named in it are all practitioners of Bagua Zhang, the ones who lived after yeah. the box opens. This, this tombstone is right, uh, is it right before? It's right after the box rebel. Jeez, is it before or after? Uh, now I, I have to check my notes, but it's right in that area. And right? the Boxer Rebellion is 1907, is that right? No, no, it's uh, it's 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 19. Uh, sorry, it's 1898 to 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 1901. It's usually the main war is right around 1900. 1901. Okay. Um. So it it you know it depends on where you start it. Right. It's like this sort of phenomenon starts growing. Um, but uh, that tombstone, right? It, it's like it's it says there's this guy, Deng Hai Chuan, who was a great fighter and he had, uh, you know, hundreds of students um, and he or, 
and you know and he he tells a sort of story about his journey it's really unclear it, it it's got a bunch of language that no one's quite sure what it means does it mean that he had a secret or did he have an opium addiction no it's kind of obscure it's got all these obscure things in it and then it says you know he was up on the on the great wall and all these people were trying to kill him um, or like fighting him, maybe not trying to kill him, but, you know, fighting. And he, he swirled around like a whirlwind and defeat, you know, could defeat them all. And this is, you know, so you're like, okay, there's a bunch of things there that people at that time, if this, if the, and I always have to question if the tombstone itself is authentic. Um, but if it's authentic, there's all these things that people thought was important or directly after at some point they thought was important. Right. So you kind of have to go, OK, so what's that information, you know, and does it square with the other stories being told? And there's all there's I mean, I go into my book in quite detail. There's all these stories being told about the first practitioners of Bhagwa Jang that are as a named art. Right. So it sets. So what we do know, in a sense, is that there's this thing that might not have had a name. Ah. Right. And. It's also quite well um, agreed among the practitioners because of because of a historical divergence in the way it's practiced through early practitioners. One, uh, there are a number of these, but there's a there's a lineage called the Jung lineage, and there's a lineage called the um, uh, Yin Yin lineage, right? So they diverge um, a little bit. They don't diverge that much, but they diverge, and so you. And, and they diverge because they both developed forms and their forms are very different. So the assum and they both claim that the, the, their, the, the beginnings of that, those lineages started the forms and that they, what they had learned originally had no form, right? So there's this sort of claim and you know, okay, well, enough people are saying that, that that's probably true. So what held the thing together? What held it together? And so, I, I mean, I, there's a lot more that went into it, but I just kept asking what held it together because I was also told that it was an improvisational art, right? That's a great, that's a really good question, historical question, um, rather than true and false or to say what held it together, that, that we can even be having this discussion. Right. Because in some ways, if we look at this tombstone, and I remember the story from your book, if we look at this tombstone as the marker of a break, no, the memorial even of a break, and you're a modern practitioner 100 years, 120 years later, saying I as a practitioner want to make sense of this memorial of a break. And is that any different from saying I as a historian want to make sense of this marker of a break from those, I'm trying to split your personality here. Um, very bad of me. Um, but I'm saying, is that a, not a little bit what you're doing, whether as a historian or a scholar or, or a practitioner at this point, we're looking back at this enigmatic marker, this memorial marker, and we want to make sense of it. We want to tie it into the narrative so that. Well, oh, oh, oh okay, okay. So part, part of part of the, the ex, part of the questioning for me actually started with Indian dance because I was like. This is such a well-developed aesthetic. It's so profoundly unique, right? And I'm talking about Indian dance right now. So profoundly unique and so profoundly developed, so well-developed that it, it's not something an individual could do. It had to both come, had to be it, things passed down and it had to have it had to have some kind of audience, some kind of patronage, some kind of um, network of people working together to make it happen. Exactly. And I and I said, when I look at Bagua Zhang, I uh, the story doesn't line up. This, you wouldn't study this because you wanted to be a great fighter exclusively. If that's your only reasoning, doesn't make any sense because there's just too many other ways to become a great fighter. And why do you want to do that anyway? Are you a criminal? Like it doesn't make sense. And so then, and then, and then the other part is that, is that, you know, it, to create something of that depth, and we're talking about something of extraordinary depth. Yeah. One individual could not create it. 
I completely dismiss that from my own experience that that's possible. I, and and it, it's also absurd because they're everywhere you go in China, there's martial arts, right? And none of them are created by individuals. They're all created from milieus. So the idea that this one art was created by an individual was, um, it, you know, someone might argue back, oh, well, he put together things that were already there in a unique way. Well, maybe. But why and what held it together? What held it together is such an interesting question. And I, I just want to throw in a couple little uh, observations on what you're saying, um, because I think that's very interesting. Um, one is this, you know, Butoh, Japanese Butoh dancing. Well, these days, there's a Butoh craze. Here in Chicago, there's a whole scene of Butoh dancers. Argentina, there's a scene. Europe, there's a scene. And I've talked to some of them. They don't know anything about the origins of buto in japan and it's only 1960s it's not that long ago um there's plenty of material about it there's plenty of recordings there's plenty of writing plenty of news articles there's plenty of material on buto it's not it's not hard to find a lot of people are still alive hichikata died in 2009 not that long ago um and yet this is what you're saying about the stridency. They're so strident about what they do as Buto and that their definition of Buto and, and they go on. And it's very interesting to see that the result of its popularity meant completely unmooring it from its rather incredible origins that aren't hard to find. And the other thing I think is interesting to mention in looking at these arts and something you're just saying, the notion of individuality is very much a Western philosophical product. It's not a widespread idea all over the world. The notion of the social individual is not such a common idea. Certainly 250 years ago in China, the notion of an individual was not a very developed notion. Um, so anybody doing something on their own name, on their own constitution, was really sort of not how society worked in a lot of ways, too. So I think your question about what held it together and held it together so somebody else could learn it, held it together so it could be transmitted, held it together because we long for these unifying myths. What, what was the reason you wanted to hold it together? And as you say, it's not just fighting. You know, fighting alone isn't enough reason to want to hold on to these inquisitive histories. And so I just thought maybe you would respond to that a little bit about individualism and how people can take an ideal and turn it into a personal conviction of their own that may or may or may not be related to something historical. So, so one reason is because it's beautiful and it ne needs to be preserved, right? And it won't be preserved if you don't get the story right. That's just, it's just the way things are. You, you can preserve things by being strident. It must be done this way. But there, that's a hook without the worm. You know, it doesn't, it, you, you actually need the story. And that's, that's what I kept finding is people were, were, People were degrading, in my view, the beauty, right? By I actually, degrading the story by because they had no story, they so they were no adding a new all. story that didn't fit the art. And when you add a story that doesn't fit the art, the art starts to change in ways that, um, that from my point of view, were de were degrading the beauty. And that's very personal, right? But let's go. But let me just that. So that's there, right? So now the individual thing. Uh, one thing I would say is that the China, Chinese culture absolutely has a concept of the individual, but it's different. It's a very different idea. And that is really hard for people to get because you, because they, they might seem to overlap sometimes. But the, there was a strong sense of the individual in China, in historic China. But it's not our idea of the individual. You don't, you didn't need to sign your name on a painting in the same way, especially not a religious painting, right? You didn't sign your name. Um, Scott, may I, may I just interject to ask a question too? I, I, I think this is so interesting 
your point that that a story, a consistent, coherent story is one of the things that sustains the preservation of a practice. And so this relationship of story to practice is very interesting. We live in an age when the storytelling has sort of been given over to professional historians that may or may not know the practice at all. And, and, and come from it with a scientific point of view, an objective point of view. And I've always thought it was so interesting. Um, you know, when I first went to, to study in China with Wang Kifan about depictions of dancing in China, um, it was the same sort of, of question of, well, it's much better in the hands of a dancer than the hands of someone who's trying to create a history that doesn't understand the form itself. And she was said, it was so interesting. She said, I never understood the West. You have experts in painting that don't know how to paint. And that she just didn't understand that. But I think part of one of the things we're dealing with here is that history is, belongs to historians and practice belongs to practitioners, but actually the story sustaining the practice belongs to the practitioners too. And so I wonder what you think about how we've designated historical storytellers in our time. We've given them the, the status of academics. We've given them the status of scholars. Um, we've got a notion of history that is debatable, uh, but we've got a notion of history um, that believes it can look with some kind of objectivity. Um, and so I wonder what you think about the story that sustains the practice and who owns that story and who gets <laughs> to change it, who gets to change the story and, and who challenges the story. Do you think it's usually the practitioners that are challenging the new story or you think it's that an older story that was tied with the practitioners might have not made it all the way through to our time? Well, I think the story was suppressed. I mean, in the case of Bagua Zhang, the story was that what just because we've been dancing all around it, um, that that there was this deity Naja who's the greatest fighter in all of China, and he spins like a whirlwind, and he was depicted by by trans mediums throughout China. Uh, it was very common, and he was deeply associated with the vanguard of the Boxer Uprising. So there was a great reason to suppress it. In fact, if you look, if you look at the literature in that period, they were like, we have to stop Naja. Even when the first films were made, one of the most popular films was, was a Naja film. It's gone now. It was a Naja film. And they were like, we have to shut, they, they shut down all Kung Fu movies. And one of the arguments they used, right, in, 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 in Shanghai, they shut down all the movies. Um, and one of the arguments they used was that the people were seeing the God as real on the stage. They were going in there seeing Naja, and we cannot have people believing in Naja. Like that's, so there was a very strong reason to suppress the connection between Bagua Zhang. If you want to preserve the art, to suppress its story and try to tell a new story. So the, the and, and that, so that is the story that when you're doing Bagua Zhang, you're riding these wind fire wheels and you're telling the story. And this is not, the, 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 the city of Beijing was actually called Naja City, right? It was, it, it was like the quintessential Beijing thing to do this ritual. There's no way that it was, and that's why you could have hundreds of followers, right? Because it was, it, it was a centerpiece of the culture of that place. And that's what they were trying to erase, right? They were actually actively trying to erase that. And it was the, it was on the stage. It was theatrical. We even know that the Dowager prin uh, um, Princess herself was a fan of a Naja actor, right? We, you know, like, we know that. It was like a little factoid that we can connect, but, you know, that it was a, it was a huge thing and that the, there were rituals. This was, this was a ritual of sacrifice that was connected to, um, to agriculture. Um, and because, because it, it, he is a kind of sacrifice and he fights dragons and dragons cause rain and this whole cosmology around it. And so, and, and, you know, I mean, Beijing was utterly destroyed and the temples were utterly destroyed. I mean, there was it, the numbers, there's like, like, like 5,000 temples that were like 
big temples? We're not talking well, about yes, the little indeed. ones. I mean, I think one of the questions I think you're touching on or issues you're touching on is China's uh, severe distrust of, of the golden elixir, but severe distrust of, and I, I think this, I've, people have always asked me, and I've heard, I've heard actually important military personnel explain what Falun Gong did, that they actually circled, the entire, they, they joined hands and circled the Forbidden City. And they're like, that was the end. We're never gonna let this happen again. Um, but the same thing in Tibet, the Chinese have just destroyed Tibet and they're building it up now, but they're building it up as a way now for tourism, uh, for rich Chinese people to get into heaven, they'll pay for a new roof, um, but they don't want the energy arts. I use that very generally. The Chinese don't want energy arts. And so I think they wanna keep trampling the story and rewriting history is something China has always done um, with any competitor, competing nation. We'll wipe you out of the books because we write them. <laughs> we'll just take you out of the books. We'll change the story. And so I think part of what you're talking about in continuity and, and breaks is that in some way, would you suggest that there's certain continuities you can't stop? And one of them is religion. People want religion. You can try to stamp it out and you're not gonna. You can reframe it. You can try to diminish the story, but you're not gonna ever diminish the impulse. And so I wonder if, if you could say anything generally about Chinese society dismantling anything that has to do with energy and doing that by probably manipulating the story. Um, well, I think you're, you're actually saying what most of what needs to be said there. Um, it, it's, it, it, but it's hard. It's hard. I mean, there, there, I can recommend uh, David Palmer has done some great work on this. Um, and it, but it's, it's hard, you know, you're what, what we don't really, okay. What, if I'm speaking generally, one of the problems is we don't know what religion is, right? There's this, there's a term in Chinese, jiao, right? Which just means teaching. So that, that's a problem um, because they didn't, they, they got the word for religion uh, from a Japanese translation of the West, of the West. So they, you know, it's like, and they, they came and like, oh, those are religions. Okay. So that's a cat, you know, that the actual category didn't really exist. It's kind of a problem when you say, when I say, you know, that, that martial arts was a religion or was inseparable from religion and inseparable from theater because theater was inseparable from religion because the category wasn't really a category, it's very right? Important. Yeah. Right. And, and so there, there isn't, and, 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 you know, when I, when I'm like, it's one of my banging my head against the wall experiences in the mar with martial arts studies scholars is that they, you know, they're like, well, we're not really interested in religion. You know, they, they have a sort of atheist bias. You see, it's, actually, I could, yeah, I could, I could go there. But actually, let me, there's a guy named Taher, Bernard, Bernard Taher, I'm not sure, it's a Dutch name, I believe, um, who, who did recently did a summary of what, what all the scholars have found about martial elements of religion. Right. He didn't. He published it as an, a very long essay, actually. I'd love and, to see it. And it's interesting, but it's like it's it's a but I hated it. It's a study in tragic, the tragic view of history. It's a study in that. It's like a perfect demonstration of how you can you can find a whole bunch of examples of something, put them in a box and say, OK, we don't know anything about this. You know, it's like, are you, did you, did you really think you could have that discussion without looking at theater? I, did you notice that you didn't mention the Monkey King once? You know, did, did, and, and all these practitioners who are alive today, who are practicing martial arts, you think there's, you, you made no connection. You didn't even make one connection in that whole, you know, is 60 page essay or whatever it is. I'm like, I don't. I, I get that you're in your own world talking to your own people, but the rest of us are out here trying to make narratives that make sense, okay, based on what the culture was, right? And that's, he actually fails to do that. That's the, that's the problem.
I, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, it's kind of faux scholarship, if you ask me. Um, and I see a lot of that. I see a lot of scholars. Um, I even mentioned this. I think there was a panel with an Indian dancer, a 35th generation priest from Nepal, and the dancer has been performing on stage internationally for 50 years. And the priest is the 35th generation, and a fellow who was raised in a monastery in Ladakh, and an Austrian art historian. And when we debriefed everybody, the Austrian art historian said very sincerely, it was interesting to be in a panel where I was the only specialist. And it was so stunning a thing for me to hear that all I could do was say, well, yes, that's how uh, amazing, you know, wow, um, say more. Um, but, but I thought, well, what a preposterous thing to think that you know everything that someone who's been a performer for 50 years knows. Um, and it was very much um, a kind of situation where people prefer to speak only to their own kind of person um, and not necessarily practitioners, which is a very interesting um, question. I, I, um, we're, we've gone over an hour now. Um, so, and we've talked on some very interesting, we started out by talking about, you know, practice and history and got to your wonderful idea of comic and tragic histories about what's the break or what's the progress. Are we looking at hist history in terms of tragedy or in terms of comedy and continuity? And so with our remaining time, maybe I'm wondering if you could just say something about within movement traditions, what it is that gives them longevity when the history is fractured, obscured, skewed, not true, a debated, debunked, um, what it is about the movement practice, what inherent attributes it may have that allows the practice to continue even to raise these questions today. Um, they're only valid questions because there is a thing called Bagua that's taught all over the world in a lot of different ways. There is something called Tai Chi that, hey, now you mention it, it's got a lot of mime in it. Um, and I'm very interested and I look at, at Mudra as we're looking at Mudra in our project. There's a lot of mime in Mudra. There's a lot of mime in Mudra. And so I'm wondering if you just have some, some closing comments or some comments about what it is that allows a practice to continue to carry on to have continuity when there is uh, variability in the story, variability in the history. Um, what is it that allows the practice to continue no matter, even, even when they're trying to abolish the history, trying to abolish understanding that nevertheless the practice continues? What is that aspect of continuity? You know, that is a that is a great and difficult question. Uh, I mean, it, it's got to be. I mean, it, oh, the very personal answer. The very personal answer is 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 an absolute immersion in an exploration of beauty, and I don't wouldn't have to call it beauty. You know, I you, you know, there's a the sublime nitty gritty of sweat and. You know, and you know, and, and feeling what feeling the the mix of pain and and you know and and the way things integrate. I mean, all of these things. I'm sort of this is my beauty, right? The world of of that the 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 joy you get in interacting with people who are who are playing the same mode, the same game, the same. The, you know, it's it's um, it it's it. It was created, all of these things were created to be shared. That's right. a very good point. And, and that, that, that intangible joy that I recognize immediately what you're talking about. Um, I see it in the strength of monastic communities, but you see it anytime dancers are together, really. Anytime martial artists get together, those are the best friendships you ever have is with your martial arts buddies, you know? There is real great joy in doing that. So I, I wonder if it goes back, you use the term beauty, and I, I wonder if it goes back to something I heard a lot in Japan is the strength of the forms. Um, the form itself is the teacher. The form itself can be a teacher. 
Um, and as anybody practices doing a set of forms, learning other forms, making connections between the forms, um, I think most people who practice anything formal um, see it as 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 the forms themselves teach you about how to do the forms as well as they teach you about other aspects of of life and the mind body complex so i'm wondering if your idea of beauty has anything to do with the strength of the form itself as it, the form as teacher you might say yeah the, okay this is monster question this one's another <laughs> hour but i but well we me, can do another hour sometime I but hope. let me just dive in for a second i i think i should tie back in this idea because it because the golden elixir really does tie everything together in some ways that this that this you know the golden elixir is a is a unique experience right it's oh it's it has to be discovered because it is unique and it it's not I don't think it's unique to China. I think they just had a way in which they, in a very, very beautiful way, the Chinese culture um, made it really central to their, their, their thoughts about creativity, about what creativity was, and their thoughts about, about um, how people are brought together with their uniqueness, right? That, 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 that framed so much uh, the golden elixir frames so much of what, you know, what was considered beauty. It, it, it's just, it's, a, it's a, almost a, an, an organizational thing in itself. But to, to, to answer the question about forms, um, this is something I, I uh, you know, Indian dance has forms, but they're sure. not so tight um, the way Chinese forms are. They're not so, they're not, so tightly organized. They have a lot more improvisation in them. They're, they're way more flexible in how you, you pass them on. Um, I, uh, <laughs> oh, there's this story. So I, my teacher left India 20 years before and I was there and then I was there with him, but I, he didn't want to visit his guru brother because the guy, I guess, emotional issues whatever, but he sent me and I went and the guys, you know, he's got these bo boxers all over his teaching center. You know, he's got these pictures of boxers as inspiration. And, and he asked me to perform, you know, like for him right there, you know, so I did this very traditional thing, you know, da ta ke kutunga, da ge din ge da, da ge da, da de, da de. you know, anyway, it's this little routine, right? And it's very martial. And cause it's, you know, I, and he's like, and he starts crying. He's like, this is the true art. You know, it's been preserved. I'm so gratified, you know, like that somebody is doing this right, you know, and, you know, it's like, so. No, that's, very, that's really beautiful. That's a, a beautiful truth of transmission. Something you just said that would say, look, you know, if, uh, um, well, go on, go on, go on. Um, so in, in, the, the Indian, so it's one of the things I got to compare because I'm studying African stuff, right? And I'm studying Western. So I'm studying, studying ballet. You know, I study Western classical music to some extent and, and all of, you know, I definitely have a Western orientation. I study Chinese stuff. I study Indian stuff. So I can look at the concept of transmission and that itself might be a fascinating book to just discuss how these things are transmitted. But one thing I learned from Indian dance, music, in fact, in some sense, more than dance, is you have these incredibly elaborate compositions. You know, 20 minutes of playing as fast as I could possibly play, and it's changing every few seconds, right? Huge, complex thing, right? And in a way, it's like, it's like if you, in the Indian tradition, it's like, they're like, okay, can you, can you make all the sounds? Okay, here, um, play, play, um, play this Beethoven piece. And you're like, uh, I, 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 what? You know, it's just like you give it to a four-year-old. You're, you're like, play this. And, and the weird thing is, you know, one in a million four-year-olds could just play the Beethoven, you know? And you're like, what? Ah. They, so they love that, right? That that actually happens. But they give it to everybody. And they're like, you'll figure it out eventually. Just stick with it. So they give you the perfect form. And that's the same, that's the same thing in China. They give you the perfect form. This is the ideal. Copy it as closely as you can and then try to find 
the motor that runs it, right? So they're like, that, that, build. That, that, that you just described Chinese ink painting. Build yourself a Maserati without the engine. And then just try to figure out the engine afterwards. That's kind of how they structure it, right? Um, whereas the African tradition is like, here's the engine. You know, it's, it's a crazy working thing. Let's see if we can get it running. And then like, let's put some wheels on it, you know? And like, let's see if we, you know, it's a different orientation toward knowledge. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's, anyway, that's my crazy answer. Um, it's a pleasure talking. <laughs> to no, that's you. a very good answer. You've reminded me. I, I no, I think this is a really interesting question about history breaks and continuity in practice. I think both are very interesting. I, I, I think history has breaks and continuity, and we need histories of both of them. And I think practice is very interesting too, because um, even as you improve what you're doing in your practice. Um, you're changing your practice. But I, I remember too talking to some no actors recently um, whose children were performing. Um, and so they had a special performance with the parents and the children in the no play. And um, some of the musicians and no actors were more concerned about the future than others. And finally, at the end, I got to interview several of them at once. And they said, well, you know, as long as one no actor has still got the true art of no, we'll be okay. Because that one no actor can teach it to somebody else. It's like you dancing in India and they go, ah, the true art still exists somewhere because he's doing it. I know it when I see it and it still exists. And so, oh, my heart is warmed in India by this white guy who learned it from an Indian hmm. to see that something essential is true and has stayed the same. And the no actor's conclusion, this is a 700 year old art, um, that that's all you need. As long as you've got someone who has the true art, you will be able, it will be able to regrow, even if it's just one no actor, one family that's got it, it will be able to grow. So then you've got the whole, what's the true art of no? <laughs> you know, the question sort of you're asking, but I think this question of continuity and breaks um, could go on and on. Continuity through breaks, um, continuity in spite of breaks, continuity by breaks in a way. Um, so I think that in some ways, looking at the question of historian saying that history is about breaks, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think if your history is about breaks, it's about breaks. Um, but certainly breaks make for compelling, dramatic storytelling. Um, and allows you to explain uh, a change in history. And then again, we're really back to who's telling the story, what's the story for, who needs the story, and why do they need it? So um, I feel that your, your, your uh, exploration with me today about this notion of practice and history and how practitioners should or should not, do you feel that practitioners all have an obligation in a way to explore history or they, they really can be satisfied with their own personal practice? Sorry for slipping in that last question there. <laughs> yeah, well, you're getting under my skin with that one. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think I should dodge it because the answer is it's the most important thing, you know, or something, but it's like, here's my dodge. I, I'm Jewish um, and we celebrate Passover. And what is Passover? Passover is a ritual in which you tell a story. Uh, is there any right way to tell the story? Mm. Can you argue during the ritual? Yeah, you can. You can. In fact, arguing is actually built into the ritual. Um, so th there are things that you argue about and and it's it, can you improvise? It's all improvised in a sense. You know, there's a there's a structure called the um, called the Haggadah um, and there are hundreds of them. <laughs> um, and so it's like. Uh, but it's an incredibly strong ritual. There's no chance, there's no 
chance of it dying at this point. Um, and because everybody's preserving it, you can you can experiment very widely if you want, if that's your personality, right? Mm -hmm. If you just want to show up and have an experience and drink four glasses of wine, that's fine. If you want, if you want to make the story better, if you want to turn it into a play, if you want to involve children, you know, then there's all sorts of ways to get the children if the rich that's in the ritual and there's ways to to blow it up or if you're with a bunch of people who are in their 70s you're gonna do the ritual differently yeah you know? and it's not it, it it's that's so i mean that's sort of my answer here is like how much does the story matter mm, it matters a lot but it, it doesn't matter that you do it just one way so, you know, it's funny you mentioned Passover because twice in my life, I accidentally went to visit Jewish friends and it was Passover. And you know, there's always an extra chair for Elijah. Hmm. And so one of my first experiences of a Jewish family was come in, sit down. We have this Elijah, sit down. And I didn't know what I was sitting down to, um, but it happened again later. What a, what a beautiful tradition. And I remember, hmm. I remember the warmth of the family, the intergenerational exchange. I do remember certain vague customs and storytelling, but I remember the warmth. I remember the instant in the, the proscribed invitation, you know, mm. and, and these were beautiful things. And it was, uh, um, I've always been very grateful that that was one of my first experiences of Judaism and Jewish people was that Passover moment because um, there's a character that's maintained. Mm. There's a character that is, um, passed on. There is a community that is, like you say, order is reformed, order is restored. And some way it's the what, order is- It's what Seder means, right? The Seder dinner. It's Seder actually means order. Means order. Um, so this is a beautiful explanation. You know, one of the groups I do some work with is the Nam Kai Norbu Zogchen practitioners in Italy. And Nam Kai Norbu, uh, in his dream state, revealed these sets of dances. He called them Vajra dances. Now, historically in Buddhism, there's a lot of examples of yogis that had visions of dances that then made them into dances. So when I heard about Nam Kai Norbu, I'm like, wow, a living one. I've got to go meet this guy. I've got to go see what these dances are. And in fact, he explains his visions in detail, drew them all out, wrote them all out, worked them all out, which is very interesting. But the, the community of people doing his dances knew nothing at all about the existence of Buddhism of dances that came from yogic visions. And it's a very established thing. It's mm. not unknown, it's well known, the dances still exist. But it was so interesting to see an entire community that was absolutely besotted and engaged and practiced and believing in these dances um, very fully without knowing anything about the history of this practice. So I, I found that a very fascinating um, and there's an exhibition up in Italy right now that talks about, too, the history of it and the current manifestation of it. So cool. um, thank you for helping me explore this topic. I feel we could go on and on. And um, I hope we can talk again in the future and explore another question. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Hey, if you like that video, don't forget to subscribe and watch the other ones. Also, check out my book. Tai Chi, Bagua Zhang, and the Golden Elixir, Internal Martial Arts Before the Boxer Uprising. And you can also find me at NorthStarMartialArts.com. Thanks.